This video is made possible by NordVPN. If you are online, you really must be using a VPN. And that's where NordVPN comes in. I know it's tempting not to bother and hope for the best, but really, those stories that you read about people having their data stolen do happen, and you don't want to make it easy for anyone to do that. But using a VPN offers more than just security. For example, NordVPN lets you access any of its thousands of servers in different countries all around the globe. So if you've hit the end of your Netflix queue, simply try changing the location of your server and get access to content libraries that, due to licensing agreements, are only available in specific geographic locations. For example, most European countries have strong licensing agreements with restricting which soccer matches can be viewed depending on the location of the viewer. With NordVPN, you can change your country without even moving from your sofa. NordVPN is super fast, so watching video is a breeze. No lag whatsoever. If you've ever used VPNs and thought they were slow, well, no more with NordVPN. And you can use it on all your devices very, very easily. Android, Chrome, Windows, Linux, and on up to six different devices. One account. Also, there are no logs kept at all, unlike companies based in the EU or the US. NordVPN is based in Panama, so they don't have to keep logs at all. Great for your privacy. So take control of your internet experience right now with NordVPN. Go to nordvpn.com forward slash visualpolitik and use code visualpolitik to get a two year plan plus one additional month with a huge discount. It's risk free with Nord's 30 day money back guarantee. Dear friends, in a past video here on Visual Politic, and together with our friends at Value School, we told you how the administration of the now ex-president of the United States of America, Donald Trump, was making huge efforts to limit the weight and integration of China into world finance, or at least to curb its growing ties to the North American markets. <laughs> However, despite the insistent messages of a possible decoupling and all the attempts of the previous US administration, if 2020 has shown us anything, it is that the integration of the Asian giant into the world's financial markets is advancing at full speed. Money is starting to pour into China because they're looking for that income. It's a really interesting point in history. The Chinese have opened up and you have the rest of the world in serious trouble. Hayden Briscoe, head of fixed income for Asia Pacific at UBS Asset Management. Despite the SARS coronavirus 2 pandemic, the political confrontation with the United States, and events as tense as those witnessed in Hong Kong, foreign investors bought more than $150 billion worth of bonds and shares in the Chinese mainland markets last year. This makes it a new historical record. In total, foreign ownership of Chinese stocks and bonds traded on these continental markets is already close to $1 trillion, eight times more than just six years ago. We are talking about a flow of investment that has accelerated since the victory of Democratic candidate Joe Biden in the US elections on 3rd of November. And that trend contributes to the fact that the CSI 300 index, China's reference index, will have its 2020 figures revalued in dollars with a 27% increase, putting it more than 13 points above the S&P 500. <laughs> something that has allowed it to beat its historical highs of 2015. Chai Next, the technology division of the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, also managed to beat the North American Nasdaq composite with a 59% appreciation measured in dollars. Yes, you see, during 2020, the Chinese markets were real stars on the world financial scene. However, all of this has only just begun. With more than 1.4 billion consumers, a middle class of more than 600 million people, ever increasing purchasing power, a huge production structure that is not fully understood, and an economy that seems capable of resisting even the attack of the coronavirus, the appetite of international investors for Chinese assets is growing. And it's not just about the investors. The international industry giants also want to take advantage of a market that is simply gigantic. Ray Dalio himself, founder and chairman of Bridgewater Associates, the world's largest hedge fund, predicted in a recent interview with the Financial Times that the markets in mainland China will soon be tough rivals for New York and London in the race for the top spot among the world's financial centers. 
China already has the world's second largest capital markets, and I think they will eventually vie for having the world's financial center. Throughout history, the largest trading countries evolved into having the global financial center and the global reserve currency. Ray Dalio. In the same interview, he also said that he expects that, over time, China will represent a very important part of Bridgewater's own business, a hedge fund with some $150 billion under management. Now, we are talking about a very extraordinary country, as we will see later, and I'm sure this won't surprise anyone. Investing in China has its risks, starting with the more than obvious political and regulatory risks. So, some of the questions we can ask ourselves are, why does China seem to be generating so much expectation in financial circles lately? What magnitudes are we talking about? How are things evolving? Will we really see China become a major player in the international financial scene? Well, let's answer all of these questions. A very coveted treasure. China is a giant, and therefore everything to do with it almost always has enormous proportions. Look at the bond market, for example. It is still, of course, much smaller than the US market, but since the end of 2018, it has been the second largest market in the world. We're talking about almost $17 trillion. These days, the Chinese market offers higher rates. At the same time, thanks to the good progress of exports and the economy, along with the growing entry of capital flows, this market is feeding a tremendously positive evolution of the Yuan. 4th of January 2021, renminbi rallies past 6.5 per dollar for the first time since 2018. Chinese currency boosted by China's economic recovery from COVID-19 after authorities successfully controlled the virus. Financial Times. And friends, we are talking about a situation which, taking into account the policies of central banks like the Fed or the European Central Bank, and the apparent strength of the Chinese economy, suggests that it may last for quite some time. And exactly the same is true of the stock market, which also ranks China as the second largest country in the world in terms of value of listed companies. Almost $11 trillion. Of course, unlike the North American markets and those of any other developed country, the case of China stands out for the reduced participation of foreign investors. For example, foreigners currently hold on to less than 5% of China's outstanding shares, far below the figure of more than 30% in markets such as Japan and South Korea. But you see, that is now starting to change. Let's be clear, the Chinese markets are simply too big and too tempting to be ignored, especially when China has been one of the few economies with positive growth in 2020, and whose forecasts for the following years are also pretty promising too. <laughs> In addition, as the role of the Chinese economy grows, companies that make stock indexes, such as the MSCI or the FTSE Russell, are increasing the weighting of Chinese assets in these indexes, which in turn forces passive investment funds to increase their exposure to the Chinese market. <laughs> These are perhaps the two most influential factors in the foreign appetite for Chinese assets. But of course, no matter how much appetite you have, if the market is closed, it is not possible to break through. However, that is also changing. The floodgates open. The Chinese government wants to increase the country's integration into the world's financial fabric. It wants to do so in order to increase its access to world capital, attract more investors, as well as to strengthen its companies, its currency, and the competitive position. As Ray Dalio said in the Financial Times interview we mentioned earlier, history seems to show that an economic powerhouse has to be a financial powerhouse as well. Well, that is exactly what the Chinese government is doing, opening its doors and facilitating access for investors and large international financial groups. For example, in 2019, Chinese regulators cleared the way for the full acquisition of local banks by foreign groups, and from 2020, it has begun to allow full foreign ownership of financial enterprises of all kinds, insurance, futures, means of payment, asset management, and so on. And that, my friends, has been a very important step. Because you see, in the past, foreign financial firms had to resign themselves to operating at best through minority stakes in joint ventures with local partners. That is, in most cases, the Chinese partner had the final control over the company. 
and now that's changed and has caused many to be rubbing their hands together. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, the Chinese financial services industry is worth about $50 trillion. Trillion with a big fat capital T. Currently, only 2% of this enormous market is in foreign hands. Thus, Bloomberg recently estimated that banks and foreign investment firms, if they improve their position, could make an additional annual profit of more than $9 billion solely from their operations in China by the end of this decade. The best example is the large American groups. Since 2019, companies such as PayPal, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, American Express, BlackRock, Citibank, and the rating agencies have been launching significant operations in this country after receiving the approval of the Chinese authorities. But it's not just the operations of large groups. The Chinese government is removing many restrictions to gradually facilitate the purchase of stocks, bonds, and derivatives by investors all around the world. Of course, there is still a lot of work to be done. The point is that all these changes promise to further increase China's interconnectedness in global financial markets. There are many risks, such as regulatory risks in a country where legal security is not exactly strong. There's also the political risk derived from the tense confrontation between Beijing and Washington and the financial risk of a possible future debt crisis that the well-known manager of hedge funds, Jim Chanos, has called a treadmill to hell. But friends, we will talk more about all of this in future videos here on Visual Politic with our friends from Value School. The question now is, is Ray Dalio's prediction right? And will investors around the world look at Shanghai or Shenzhen as much as they now look at Wall Street in a few years' time? Leave your answers down in the comments below. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. And as always, I'll see you in the next video. And if you want to learn more about politics and hear even more of my lovely voice, you can join us at Reconsider Media. We have a podcast at reconsidermedia.com slash podcast. See you there.